continue on here, we're going to just elaborate on those factors. So simple diffusion, the factors that affect it. The first one is the magnitude of the driving force. In other words, how strong is that concentration gradient? And as we can see from this graph, if the concentration gradient increases, so does the net flux. And that's going to be the linear curve that represents the simple diffusion. So as high as we can raise that concentration gradient, that's as fast as we're going to get particles moving. All right. And that is going to be um, a directly proportional relationship. And that is going to be a continuous relationship. Right. There's no limit to how fast we can move particles um, based upon how big we can get that concentration gradient. The second factor, the membrane surface area. So if we have a lot of surface area available, um, it just makes more sense. We're going to have a lot more opportunities for particles to actually engage with the membrane and go straight across. What we're seeing here are two images, two histological images. One is showing normal alveoli in the lungs. One is showing uh, emphysema, so abnormal alveoli. And so what we can basically see right here is that with emphysema, we lose a lot of the surface area of the alveoli. So this is a nice uh, image showing the increased uh, or um, the abundant amount of alveoli, where right? all of these little spaces uh, basically help to increase the surface area for gas exchange in the lungs. But then in emphysema, we see collapsing of the alveoli, where the walls, the walls excuse me, basically disappear. This happens a lot from damage with smoking. Um, but the walls basically collapse on themselves. And what we end up seeing are bigger spaces and less uh, membrane uh, for exchange of oxygen mainly, oxygen and CO2 as well. So this is a great example to show us the difference in the amount of exchange that we would expect if we had less surface area available. So in the normal lungs, we're going to have a lot or a high rate of oxygen transfer or oxygen exchange. Whereas in someone with emphysema, because they have less surface area, they're going to have a slower or lower rate of oxygen exchange. OK, so a really um, important and relevant clinical example that really illustrates how the surface area plays a role in exchange or in membrane transport. The third factor, so this is the one that I said was much more important than the other two, also relied on some other separate variables. So this one was the permeability of the um, membrane, so the membrane permeability, very important in terms of its effect on the rate of simple diffusion. But the membrane permeability is also determined by other variables. One is the lipid solubility. So how likely is that particle to go through the phospholipid bilayer. This is really determined by its polarity, all right? So if it is nonpolar, it's gonna go through the membrane very well. If it is polar, it is not going to go through the membrane. So the lipid solubility, how well it can interact in lipid environments, right? Nonpolar being the, 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 the favored uh, feature here. Um, is going to determine the membrane permeability. And the membrane permeability is going to then determine the rate of simple diffusion. So we have a couple levels that we're looking at here. Um, the second factor that affects the membrane permeability is the size and shape of the particle. Like we said before, if the particle is big and bulky, right, or it's an abnormal shape, it's not going to go through the membrane very easily. It's going to need some of the other um, helpers that we talked about, either a channel or a transporter. So if we have a large bulky particle, we're going to have zero membrane permeability. We're going to have zero simple diffusion. Um, the other thing is the temperature. So the temperature is not really relevant in human physiology simply because of homeostasis. We know that our 
uh, temperature is usually kept within a very tight window of control. And so we're not going to really exhibit, we're not going to really experience rather um, too much variation in our normal, from our normal body temperature. So temperature is not so relevant for our human physiology, but it will be relevant if you were to be doing an experiment. Let's say you had a beaker or a test tube that you were trying to monitor the movement of particles across, if you increase the heat, increase the temperature of that um, solution or that container, you will increase the movement, just the energetic movement of particles, and they're going to be more likely to bump into the membrane, right, because they're more active, and so they're going to be more likely to go across the membrane as well. So the temperature is one of those factors that is more so in um, more of an experimental um, or um, uh, a, a simulated uh, environment, but not so much in our human physiology, but it makes sense as well. If we can increase the heat, we can increase the thermal activity of particles, they're going to be more likely to be bouncing all over the place, they're going to be more likely to encounter the membrane and then to go across. The fourth factor that affects the membrane permeability is the thickness of the membrane. And this one is really, again, sort of self-explanatory. If I have a thick membrane, it's going to be harder for particles to get through. They're just going to have more stuff. It's going to be a longer journey. It's going to be more of a block in terms of getting those particles through the membrane. Um, again, this can come into play when we talk about more clinical um, scenarios like fibrosis of the lungs. If we have fibrosis, which is thickening and scarring of the lung tissue of the alveoli, so the membrane goes from being nice and thin like this, to being very fibrotic and thick. And so as we would expect, it's going to be harder for particles to get through this thicker membrane than it is for particles to get through a much thinner membrane. Okay. Um, what I want to reemphasize here, because students often sort of struggle with this, is the factors that we have described here are only relevant to the membrane permeability. And then the membrane permeability is relevant to the simple diffusion rate, okay? So these are the factors that influence how permeable the membrane is, and then the membrane permeability in turn affects the rate of simple diffusion. All right. Um, if you look at this graph here on the right, we can, co again, compare the concentration gradient to the net flux. So we can compare something that has low permeability to something that has high permeability. Um, examples of this down here would be uh, large particles, uh, polar particles are not going to have a very high permeability. Um, charged particles are not going to have a high uh, permeability. Um, what else? Bulky particles are also not going to be able to go through very well. And then things that have a high permeability are going to be nonpolar, uh, uncharged, right? So not ions, um, small in terms of their general size. Um, those types of molecules are going to more likely, more easily go through that membrane. And so in that scenario, we would say that the membrane has a higher permeability for said particles. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to skip over these checkpoint questions. Um, we're going to get back to them at the beginning of next session. I'm going to move on here to objective three, which is comparing the movement of molecules across the plasma membrane by carriers and through channels. So this just gets into the other two examples of simple, of, um, of passive transport. So remember, we had passive transport and then we had three examples, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and movement through channels. So we've talked about simple diffusion. Remember, simple diffusion needed no help, no carriers, no proteins, no channels. Things were able to go right through the membrane based upon the factors that we discussed. The second example of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. This one is where we do require some help. So here we're going to rely on the presence of carriers, which are transmembrane proteins. There are proteins that are embedded in the membrane, as we can see here. So they are interspersed in between the phospholipids that make up the bilayer. And they're going to have binding sites that are going to be specific to some particles. Um, the particle is going to bind to one side. Here's an example of 
a, a transporter that is specific to glucose. This one is actually called the GLUT4 transporter. All right, and this is embedded in the cell membrane. It's going to have one binding side that can bind glucose. Then it's going to undergo this conformational change or configurational change. It's basically going to shape shift. And then on the other side of the cell, it's going to spit that, that, that glucose molecule into the intracellular space. And so that is how we can help glucose get across the membrane. Now, this is still going to be considered diffusion, right? Really important to emphasize this word diffusion here because it's still going to be moving glucose along a concentration gradient. Also, we want to in, uh, emphasize the word passive because this is still a downhill spontaneous movement. Although we're requiring the help of a carrier or a transporter, the gradient is still the same. In other words, we had to have a high amount of glucose here and a low amount of glucose here. The only thing that we needed help with was just getting it through the membrane, and that is where this transporter comes into play. All right, so this is still an example of passive transport, although we are requiring the help of the transporter in the membrane. If we look at the factors that affect the rate of glucose transport, they're going to be um, determined by the rate of transport for each carrier. So each individual transmembrane protein that's in the membrane has a specific rate with which it can carry glucose across. Um, the number of carriers, so that's going to also play a crucial role. Let's say I'm trying to move lots of glucose across this really large concentration gradient, but I only have one carrier in the membrane. Guess what? That rate of facilitated diffusion is going to be very low because I'm going to have to wait a long time for each glucose molecule to engage with that carrier, shape shift, and then get inside the cell. So the number of carriers is also going to affect the rate of uh, facilitated diffusion. And then, uh, as we described, for simple diffusion, the concentration gradient is also going to play a role. If we have no concentration gradient, we'll have no movement, even though we have a transporter. We'll have no movement if we have no concentration gradient. However, there's one crucial difference in terms of the graph or the curve for this relationship. So for facilitated diffusion, if we compare the net flux of particles to the concentration gradient, we're going to see that it's going to start out as a nice linear equation the way that we saw for simple diffusion. But however, there's going to become a time or a point in which this curve is going to level off and flatten out. In other words, beyond this point, it doesn't matter how high the concentration gradient goes, we will no longer have any further increase in the net flux or net movement of particles. Okay, and the reason for that is, again, the rate of transport of the carriers. Let's say we're transporting glucose and all those glu glucose transporters get maxed out. They all become uh, what we call saturated. They're all doing the most that they can. They're all transferring as much glucose as they can, and they just simply get maxed out. Even though we keep increasing our concentration gradient, we're not going to see any further increase in the net flux of particles because we have reached a, a, a maximum point of glucose transporter, transporters, and so the curve here is going to level off, and we're going to have no further increase in net movement. Okay, so this curve looks very different from the facilitated diffusion curve because there are, uh, sorry, from the simple diffusion curve because there was no limit to the amount of particles that can move. There was no limit to the rate of simple diffusion. If we increase the concentration gradient, we're going to increase the net flux, and there was no limit on that rate. Here, because we do have a limited variable, the limited variable is the number of carriers that are needed to actually move that glucose across. And so when we maximize those transporters, we're going to maximize our net flux. All right.
Okay. Um, so just to reiterate that example here, GLUT4 is the name of this transporter. Um, these molecules are going to be made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. If you think back to your prior knowledge, the rough ER is where we make uh, any type of protein that's going to be used inside the cell versus the free ribosomes is where we make proteins that are going to be exported outside of the cell. Um, they're going to be packaged into vesicles, right? And then they're going to be transported to the membrane and then inserted into the membrane. If we think about conditions like diabetes mellitus, diabetes is a condition where um, the lack of insulin means that there are less root four transporters inserted into the membrane. This is specifically for uh, diabetes type one. And diabetic uh, persons who have diabetes type one uh, lack insulin, so they don't have enough insulin. This is why they have to uh, supplement insulin through um, injections. Um, but persons who have diabetes type one, they don't have enough insulin. For some reason, the pancreas does not secrete the amount of insulin. This becomes important because insulin is the trigger to actually insert GLUT4 transporters into the membrane. So we take in a large meal, let's say it's a really carbohydrate-rich meal, it's got lots of starch in it or sugar in it, that increases the amount of glucose that's circulating in our blood, all right? That will stimulate our pancreas to release insulin. Insulin will stimulate the insertion of these GLUT4 transporters into the membrane, and then the GLUT4 transporters will help to move that glucose into the cell. So we're going to take that glucose from the blood, move it into the cell, and now we can actually begin to utilize it um, in the cytosol for glycolysis to begin that glucose oxidation, right? So if we don't have insulin, we don't have the trigger that will help to insert or upregulate these transporters into the membrane. And basically, we can have lots of glucose and not be able to use it. Remember, if glucose cannot get into the cell, we can't use it. We can't start to break it down by glycolysis. So this is where diabetes um, patients will typically have very high blood glucose levels because it's not that they don't have glucose, it's just that they can't use it because they don't have insulin to trigger the reaction to insert these transporters so that it can be uptaken and actually used. So this is where these transporters and this type of transport becomes important as it relates to the metabolism of glucose. All right, so they have less glucose uptake and more of that glucose lingering in the blood, and that can become very dangerous. So glucose can become damaging to the blood vessels. If it's lingering in the blood for too long, it can become damaging to the um, smaller neurons in the eyes, in the feet, um, and it can lead to a lot of um, damaging consequences in, in long term.